Um, so yes, welcome um, to the second day of the Engage conference. Um, we're really pleased with um, everybody who's attending and really pleased also with having such a great panel today. Um, it's been really great and, you know, feeling like we're really reaching across the world with people here from the UK, Canada and India. So that's great. Um, you know, sort of trying to look at also what masculinity means in different parts of the world, because there is masculinity, which we often talk about in a Western context, um, but it's, it'll be also be interesting to see, you know, your points, seeing here your points of humor hit because you might have some different views on different things. Um, but I'm also obviously aware of the fact that masculinity is a Western concept and because Western is colonized pretty much everywhere, that's probably also spread quite similarly across the globe, even though there might be some differences and especially with, you know, the impact of media nowadays, which reaches in the furthest corners of the world and also um, promoting the Western ideas about masculinity. Um, so that's something that I'm really quite interested in. Um, but before we get started, just some short introductions. Um, I'll try and do them in alphabetical order. If I don't, then that's that. Um, <laughs> but today we've got with us um, from Canada, um, Dr. Gerald Walton, who's a professor um, at the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University in Ontario, Canada. Um, and um, Gerald recently co-authored a book, Being Boys, Shaping Gender Norms to Weaken Rape Culture. Um, and that came out earlier this year. And it obviously ties into the discussions that we want to have about masculinity and the impact that it has. How does it connect to rape culture? Um, so yeah, we're really pleased um, that Joel could be here today. Um, and secondly, we've got Mohit. Ooh, I should have asked about your surname as well. How to pronounce it? Is it Dudeja? Yeah, it's Mohit Dudeja. Dudeja, Mohit Dudeja. I stand corrected. Thank you. Um, and Mohit is the founder and president of the Mend Life Foundation. Um, and Mend Life is an Indian NGO whose mission it is to educate and empower underprivileged youth. Um, Mohit will also soon be starting a PhD on the intersection of sexuality, gender, and education, um, which I'm sure is related to his you know, founding and the work that he does with Mend Life. And then lastly, a little bit more locally, um, joining us from Durham is um, Dr. Stephen Burrell, who's a Leverholm Early Career Research Fellow at the Department of Sociology in Durham. And um, Stephen recently co-authored a book um, called Men's Activism to End Male Violence Against Women, which I haven't read yet, but I'm really excited because that also only recently came out. And um, I can't think that there's many books being written on that subject. And I know it's you know, incorporating lots of different perspectives from all across Europe. So I think that would be really interesting read because part of what we're trying to do with the conference is to get men active. So um, yeah, really looking forward to seeing some of that and um, reading about things that are happening. Um, but yeah, with the um, introductions out of the way, we'd really like to move over to um, the discussion. I've just lost my slide, so let me just have a quick look at how we're going to start. Um, I'm still sort of getting the ropes of how to run online events. It's not really something that I normally do, so <laughs> apologies for that. Um, so initially, um, I thought it would, would be good to just sort of start a little bit about um, the concept of masculinity and you know, as I said earlier, there's three different people here living in different countries. Um, so the question that I wanted to put out first was, there's, you know, three people um, on the panel from different cultures. And I'd just like to know if you could tell us really briefly in two or three minutes, what you think masculinity looks like in your culture. Um, so yeah, Mohit, maybe if you can start, a full, can start us off on that one, that'd be really Sure, thank you, Bjorn. So um, I think though it's not solely responsible yet, I believe that culture plays a central role in 
in the recurrent justification and glorification of masculinity in any culture for that matter. Yeah. And I see masculinity as a reinforcement of strong and aggressive ideas of being a man as dictated by various cultures across India. Um, a woman being beaten for loving a man of her choice. Um, many such incidents are reported often where villages collectively uh, beat women uh, and even girls uh, for that matter for choosing their life partner. In, in such a culture, it is, I think it's just extreme crime that a woman loves another woman or even a man loves another man is treated with violence. So this is how I see masculinity playing a role in its uh, at its center in India. And what's really striking in the barbarity of this violence is the absence of any women among the felon. Uh, these theaters of cruelty have all male cast. But does that mean that women do not perpetrate violence at all? Unfortunately, they do. Even there, the cause of violence is toxic masculinity. The culture that stalks such violence smacks um, an aggressive masculine pride. The idea of masculinity is not tied to how one looks as such, but more to the socio-cultural ideologies and practices of manhood. I mean, of course, it's also about looking masculine or muscular for that matter to be a man. But even so, uh, when a man does not really look like muscular but then also what is really important for that man to be a man is to practice the socio-cultural ideologies and practices of manhood which includes how they treat women in their life that is their wife their girlfriend sister mother uh, manhood for that matter is not naturally given it is a goal to be achieved to be born as a boy is definitely a privilege but that privilege can easily be lost if one does not adhere to the masculine practices that the culture sort of uh, dictates. It's, it's to treat women in a certain way and also to treat other men also a certain way. It's, it's a whole lot of power dynamics that we see every day in, in our cultures prevailing. So yeah, that's I think uh, would be my response to uh, how masculinity looks like in our culture specifically in India and what, what I have observed so far. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's really great. Thank you, Mohit. And I think one of the things that I really picked up on that is this idea that masculinity is toxic for everyone. Men pick up what those expectations are, but women also get impacted by that. So it's not just something that affects men, it affects all of society. So yeah, thank you very much for that. That was really great. Um, Gerald, if I can maybe, you know, give, give the word to you, I'd just like to, you know, know what your thoughts were and if you've got any, you know, responses possibly also to what Mo Hitta said, because I saw you nodding quite a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap between uh, some of the points that Mohit was bringing up and ones that I want to bring up and hopefully I'll add some other things as well. So one of the things is that I'm not, I'm not so sure that masculinity in itself is a problem. I think that, you know, uh, how it might get expressed and what the ideological positions are beneath those expressions are the problem, not so much masculinity itself, I don't think. Um, but when I think about what masculinity looks like, that's a really complex question because masculinity is um, expressed in a lot of different ways and those different ways are mediated by things like class and uh, race and religion and sexuality, among other things. So it's a really, really complex thing to get at. I mean, whole books have been written about this, right? Um, but uh, various expressions of masculinity, however those are done, are um, accorded varying levels of social status. So depending on how you are presenting yourself in your masculinity and what you look like and where you are from and all these other things, you are accorded various varying, I should say, levels of social status in society. It's very much a, a hierarchy or rather overlapping hierarchies. Um, however, um, despite all of that complexity, um, the results of masculinity insofar as male privilege go, <laughs> and somebody's typing away, um, is that um, in government, sports, religion, business, and all other realms of society, men dominate across the world, right? That, that's sort of the, the fact of it all. Um, I want to say a couple more points. 
um, I refer a lot to male privilege. And by that, I do not mean that um, all girls and women are passive victims. That's certainly not the case. Uh, there's a lot of uh, women who have been able to access male-dominated occupations, for instance. Um, I don't also mean that every man holds a worldview that girls and women are inferior to boys and men. That's not the case either, which makes it all the more complex. Um, I think that these ideas are simplistic thinking, and what is more complex um, is the intersections that I talked about. But in general, I would say that patterns of male privilege and sexism based on mac masculinity remain largely in place. One last point I wanna make, um, masculinity is not the exclusive domain of boys and men, right? We do not hold the corner on masculinity. And um, so uh, women and girls can, uh, can express masculinity in various ways as well. We don't own masculinity. Um, despite the fact that um, masculinity is the norm and the dominant expectation for boys and men, pretty much across the board. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gerald. I think that, that last comment was really interesting in the fact that how, how we see it, because I think when we do talk about masculinity, we often just associate it with men and boys. But I, I guess what you're saying is we're all on a spectrum of having you know, behaviors that are masculine, feminine, that's how it's seen by the world. And, you know, women can express masculine behaviors and men can express female behaviors. And that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, Stephen, coming to you then, um, what would you say from, from your experience, from your thinking, um, you know, what does masculinity look like to you in, in the UK at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to say, firstly, unfortunately, I'm actually not in Durham currently, although I do live in Durham. I'm actually visiting my, my family currently down south um, in, in a town called Banbury, which is why I'm in this like slightly strange environment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, and I, I would agree with what Gerald said in the sense that like, it feels very hard to generalize about like the UK context as a whole, because obviously, yeah, there are all sorts of different expressions of of masculinity going on there. Um, but also what Gerald said, I think is really important that first of all, some of those are valued and have more power than others. And secondly, I do think that there are, there are often some commonalities, right? Especially among those forms of masculinity, which are more valued or kind of a more dominant in society or kind of more kind of culturally exalted in a way. Um, and often I think, you know, we do still see, you know, that is traits like being tough, being strong, being unemotional, being um, prepared to use violence, um, being powerful, you know, those ideas are still quite influential, I think. But on the other hand, I, I think it is important to recognize as well, there has been, you know, quite a bit of social change, right, in, in terms of masculinity in recent decades. And, and actually, I think a lot of that is down to the feminist movement or, or feminist movements, you know, that they have really had a big impact on men and boys and really encouraged us to think about these things and to reflect and to kind of, they have, I think, instigated quite significant shifts in, in our behavior. So, for example, we do see, you know, men more involved in fatherhood now in the UK, you know, obviously still no, nowhere near as much as women in terms of caregiving, but there have been some shifts there. And, you know, with the maybe the pandemic has also kind of accelerated that, in, at least among some fathers, you know, because of school closures and um, more people working from home. Um, so, yeah, these things are constantly uh, changing. And I think that's important to recognize, not least because it shows that we can change these things, right? They're not set in stone. We, society can change and we can help to make that change happen. And there are lots of men out there who do in, in all sorts of different ways challenge those dominant expectations of masculinity. So I, and I suppose for me, maybe the, a key task is to is to highlight that. And, and I suppose to try and represent those different forms of masculinity more in like different parts of our culture, for example, because I think most of our culture does still sell this, this you know, quite narrow idea of masculinity which is very much along the lines of those things i i just mentioned um yeah yes thank you Stephen. and i think you know the word of you saying selling makes me think of the media how much power they have and the images that they sort of sell us and how that feeds into then the wider context and um the the next points that we really want to discuss have already been highlighted a little bit um i guess you know, sort of coming back to you, Gerald, I was wondering, you know, how do you think masculine norms or expectations affect, you know, men and their behavior? 
Yeah, thanks, Bjorn. Um, I I think that that too is is a is a complex question, and I you know I hesitate to to um, draw um, strokes that are too broad on this. Um, so I'm going to have to generalize, and the general statement I would make is that <clears throat> um, by and large, boys and men continue to be despite changes that have happened, which Stephen so rightly pointed to, uh, boys and men continue to be uh, largely adversely affected um, in Western culture anyway, um, by a form of masculinity that privileges, polices, and enforces what I would refer to as hegemonic masculinity. That's obviously not my phrase, but that's a word that I really like because it really gets at the, um, the dominance part of masculinity and the enforcement part of it. So we don't, we don't necessarily have um, the freedom to express our masculinity or femininity in any way we want without some kind of social repercussion or response. We don't. So, um, so there is a dominant form of masculinity that says this is how you should be and this is how you're going to be or you're going to have consequences or you're going to experience consequences. Um, and so it could be as subtle as um, masculinity ex being expressed by taking up physical space, taking up social space, either through a voice and talking a lot or talking loudly, um, or taking up physical space, literal physical space, taking it up, taking up the room. Um, it could also be in a more, a less subtle form, in the form of homophobic taunts and homophobic bullying and sexist uh, remarks and misogynist remarks and misogynist attitudes, those sorts of things. Um, uh, and yet, uh, the other part that I would add to this as a hopeful piece is that there are ways of resisting dominant forces, right? So, uh, you know, Stephen has already mentioned a couple of uh, the, the idea that, you know, there, there is sort of progress insofar as chipping away at the dominant form of masculinity that we're all sort of trying to grapple with. Um, so there are, you know, parents who are trying to raise their boys with a stronger sense of humanity, not so much the idea of, you know, big boys don't cry and all that, you know, tired, worn out nonsense. Uh, there are parents trying to do different things and better things um, to resist um, hegemonic masculinity. So that, those are hopeful things. Brilliant. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, and, and that in combination with you said earlier, Stephen, it makes me just think about something that Robert Jensen said yesterday about sort of like how feminism can sometimes give us answers that we can't really find in mainstream conversations. There's like real, real great analysis from feminists that we can use as men to show us a different way of being and different ways of to looking at things. And I think that's sort of what I picked up from both of your comments there. Um, Mohit, I was just wondering whether you had anything to add to what Gerald just said. Uh, so I, I was actually literally thinking about uh, both the comments made by Stephen and Gerald about how things are changing, right? And I was thinking in Indian context and I realized that things um, are changing in India as well, but they're very slow. So I would say that uh, around 65% of Indian population is urban, oh, sorry, in, is rural, I'm sorry. And only 35% population is uh, urban. And the change that we're talking about, that is not even touching the rural population. So it's only reaching the 35%. And even there, we don't see the change. So which means that when it comes to recognizing the change or even thinking about that, how this change is further playing its role. So there also, it's only reaching to just the 35% of the population and not the complete population that is there in the urban spaces as well. Uh, while your question was also about that, you know, how uh, these masculine norms and expectations impact men. So I wanted to go forward to that a little bit. And I would say that it's, it's not only male adults, but even the children have a constant pressure of maintaining the privilege of being a boy or man uh, by their regular performance that I just talked about previously, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant effort that they need to make to retain the privilege that they have. So I see even uh, in, in schools today that even uh, boys who do not adhere to masculine practices, such as, you know, using abusive language, materializing women, um, sexist slurs that Gerald talked about, and, uh, and not walking or talking a certain way, which uh, he referred to as homophobic uh, slurs that they, uh, you know, get. So, so uh, or, or doing things which are considered tough or masculine. 
you know not showing aggression are they're they're more likely to be bullied in 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 many cases they also face violence in within the school system like their children they're not even men they're the very young boys uh, i remember from my own school experience when i was in class 5th 6th even then i used to be bullied for the feminine expression that i had uh and and the media has been constantly reinforcing the idea of being a real man for ages and that is what i hear even the school boys saying now that a real man is one who who is eager to pick up on fight and if he does not then he is told to wear bangles on his wrist so this bangle on his wrist you know wearing that that is an expression that's very prevalent in indian media uh and putting it culturally since only women are supposed to wear bangles on their wrist ideally in indian culture so so boys and men who do not adhere to those sort of masculine norms are bullied by such slurs so gender based bullying is mostly faced by effeminate boys for their non masculine behavior and choices such as you know sports and even the subjects for that matter uh so so they they must demonstrate uh, the behavior that is considered manly or otherwise they will be questioned or bullied men on the other hand have immense pressure of maintaining the masculine pride uh by taking the whole financial burden on themselves so like i said that you know even the changes that we're talking about the now that women have also started working and all that so that has not really touched the a rural population in india so it's only about the 35% population that is there in the urban spaces and even there not all women work and and that's how the financial burden is all on men and they must be you know tough muscular unemotional they must not feel disappointed easily must not grieve and cry i mean like uh, jerel talked about uh, you know he mentioned that you know big boys don't cry that is still a notion in 65% of india and even in 35% of india where i am i am a gender facilitator i visit schools and this notion is still there in these schools i am a part of the urban population i go to the urban schools so so it's even that is still here so that's how uh, behind we are and 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 it it does uh, you know put a lot of pressure on men to not be authentic enough wearing a heavy mask of masculinity all the time as unfortunate as it sounds that men to show empathy understanding gentleness and compassion is against the norms of masculinity and this is what masculinity is causing men to go through yeah so uh, i would also like to you know then take it to a paradox that it shows say that that the women uh, mostly in uh, the urban spaces in order to prove themselves equal to men they also try to impose some bit of masculine norms that i talked about earlier as well that jared also sort of highlighted so men because they are supposed to be ambitious ruthless at the same time once they set a goal it must be achieved regardless of the consequences to others so because this winning thing is something that is considered masculine so now women are also trying to take it so even women in higher position you know they have started looking at success with a similar lens and they also try to act ruthless and ambitious so to say uh, in order to express masculinity yeah so to be a tough woman is to suppress empathy towards others and to be embarrassed by fear or other vulnerabilities is what is being practiced by the women so like gerald said that it's really not uh, masculinity is not owned by men and uh, boys it is being practiced by others as well and in all ways i mean there is this lens as well where you know the negative notion of masculinity is also being practiced by women to be able to be equivalent to men i mean which is also again what i see as a a faulty way so yeah thanks well i guess that those last comments that you made then made me think of the political system that we live in which is the patriarchy and which sets the expectations and the ways in which you can behave to get where you want to be and it's also capitalism so yeah if the way to get to the top is being ruthless then if you want to go to the top you're going to have to be ruthless and it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman because that is the rule that that is the rules of the game we're playing patriarchal capitalism um and i think you know the comment of 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 ruthlessness sort of ties in a little bit um into the question that we were asking but also a little bit um into the next question question so i'm just going to go to you steven um 
you know, so the impact of masculinity on men and boys, because I think that's an important point you highlighted as well, Mohit, it starts, starts really early, but then also, how does that tie in, um, do you think, Stephen, into, you know, um, male violence and male violence against women specifically, because I know that's something that you're researching as well. Yeah, I think it's I think it's absolutely central to it. I mean, most most violence and abuse in society of all different forms is perpetrated by men, right? And I don't think that's in any way because men are somehow like innately or inherently violent or aggressive or anything like that, because a lot of men and boys don't use violence, right? And and violence types of violence that are used or which are commonplace vary from society to society. So again, this must be something coming out of society and how we define being a man, which is obviously why we're why we're talking about masculinity in the first place. Um, <clears throat> And I mean, one of the theories which I always come back to, <clears throat> you know, was from uh, Michael Kaufman, who uh, was one of the founders of the White Ribbon Campaign, you know, from Canada. And he wrote about this in like the 80s, you know, that he came up with the idea of the triad of men's violence, you know, uh, to argue that men's violence towards women, men's violence towards other men and men's violence towards ourselves in terms of like self-destructive behaviors are all interconnected. And, and that comes back to these ideas and expectations and norms around masculinity. Um, because so often, as, as I mentioned before, like that is about being powerful, uh, being in control uh, of your own life um, and also perhaps of other people around you and especially uh, women and children, because as you said, we live in a patriarchal society and there is an expectation often that, you know, within relationships, within the family um, and other settings, men should have more power and have and have a kind of sense of entitlement to that that power, I suppose, and and therefore perhaps might use violence um, and abuse or control and coercion as a way of trying to assert that power or regain it or or kind of prove your masculinity to other men, you know, by by using violence or abuse or harassment towards towards women, for example. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's absolutely the heart of it. And, and I think it's really uh, valuable, actually, and, and necessary to draw the connections between these, these different forms of violence that we see um, and, and how, how, they, how they are linked in their causes and, and in terms of how we can prevent them. You know, I think if we can change what it means to be a man and um, reduce the pressures on men and boys from a young age to, to conform to those kind of harmful expectations, then we can prevent we can prevent violence um, from happening. And, and just one other thing to say there as well is I do think that another part of masculinity, which I think is very commonplace, you know, when boys are being brought up is actually being prepared to use violence, right? Like if I think about my own upbringing, um, you know, my parents are very kind of, you know, liberal and progressive and nice parents, but even still, like, I was very influenced by societal ideas about, you know, that as a boy, I should be prepared to use violence. And, you know, if I'm being picked on and um, I don't respond with violence to defend myself, then somehow you're not a real man, you know, and, um, and you're showing weakness. And that's like the worst thing you can do as a boy or, or a man. And, you know, you just, again, you look at our culture and in so many ways, you know, men's violence is normalized and, perhaps even constructed sometimes as being desirable, you know, in some way, if you look at films and, or, you know, pornography, you know, I, I'm sure Robert Jensen was talking about this yesterday, how like is male kind of dominance and aggression normalized in that setting, for example. Um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, th there's a lot we need to address there, yeah. <laughs> no, there is, and you know, Robert Jensen did of course bring all of that up in, in the way that he does. And he was really you know, clear about that. And you know, the word entitlement also came up and it's something that we've come back to quite a lot. And I think the thing that it's made me um, think is how um, what you termed, I guess, ruthlessness, Mohit, and what you said entitlement has got this, I guess, this element to it of like, I will get what I want, no matter what the consequences or it doesn't matter how I get it. Um, so there is that, it makes me think about if I can't get it this way, I will try something more violent. And if I can't get it that way, I will go more violent because the object is to get what I want and the how does not matter. Um, and you know, because all of these things are connected, I might be going a little bit off script here, but like, because, you know, we did have sort of like a table, but I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about, you know, you mentioned the violence, the entitlement, and um, Mohit was talking about ruthlessness. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned Robert Jensen, and I know you've, you've written about rape culture, Gerald. So, you know, it sort of seems like a point where I think, well, these things are all connected. So I'm thinking about, you know, where does rape culture fit into that? How does masculinity feed into that? And where do the 
entitlement and the ruthlessness that, that men are brought up with that enable them, tell them that this is what they should be doing and which, you know, also culturally probably is a large part of why it's so excused um, that men do commit that violence. So, uh, yeah, I just wondered whether you could say something about that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bjorn. Um, so the way that I, the way that I think about rape culture is that it is um, a much broader, it's a, it's a very broad thing. And I see it as a sort of collection, I guess, of um, attitudes, um, beliefs, perspectives, and also behaviors that are kind of rooted in um, these ideas that we've already been talking about around social status of dominant masculinity, entitlement of boys and men, learned entitlement, that is, and also the rewards of um, a boy or a man being, being uh, um, normatively masculine, as we might expect. There are rewards and people support that, right? So who is going to give up those rewards and who's going to give up that status willingly? There's going to be if there's a perceived kind of threat or questioning of that, there's going to be a response and that response is typically going to be negative. But as far as rape culture goes, it's this um, context of gender normativity in which um, violence like rape itself and sexual assault happen or, or, or given the um, conditions upon which they happen. Um, so rape culture is fundamentally about power. It's about um, attitudes. It's about perspectives. It's about beliefs. We learn those right from the day we're born, if we're boys, that is, or if we're perceived to be boys, if we're born male. Whether we're boys or not is another matter. <laughs> but, um, but it's about power, and it's about keeping that, um, that, that masculine power in place. And, you know, Stephen was alluding to this a little bit as well, that it is, it is about... Um, uh, trying to gain that power and trying to keep it once it's there. Um, and one of the expressions of trying to keep that power is through sexual assault and rape. And so, but those things happen in a broader context of rape culture. The other thing that I want to say about rape culture is that whereas probably most, if not all people, understand rape as being violence and as being, you know, a bad thing, um, it's much harder, I think, for people to understand the idea of rape culture and really acknowledging that rape culture is expressed in daily things, right? So we can easily say to ourselves, oh, you know, only those men rape, you know, I'm not like that and that's perfectly fine and that might be perfectly true. But the harder part for us to see and admit is how we support rape culture, we support the conditions um, by other things that we do that are gender normative, that we have come to believe are just like, this is the way men and boys are. Um, but those, those things are rooted in power and male privilege and sexism and all of that. The other thing that I wanna say about rape culture too is that it is an expression of power. It is where power operates. And so one of the other ways that it gives rise to or sort of allows conditions to happen is um, rape as a political tactic in war, which is, you know, possibly one of the most egregious things I can think of, but it happens in every war in, and in every sort of conflict. It's, it's, a, it's a weapon of war. And it is, again, about asserting power in a very horrific way. Um, so rape culture is broad, rape itself and sexual assault are narrow, but they're both connected because one get, gives the conditions for the other. Thank you, Gerald. And I think, you know, that point about rape culture all, almost being this invisible thing that's all around us is really important. And um, it, it's something that I actually heard recently on a different podcast. I think it was a feminist men podcast where they were talking about rape culture. And I thought, oh yeah, I never really thought about it. You know, I, it's here everywhere, but I can't see it. And it's all the, you know, things that we do that feed into that, that we might not even be aware of. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for for making that point and everything else that you said. And I guess I wanted to just come to you quickly, Mohit, because you know, I said at the start you'll be starting a PhD, and it's you know about sexuality, gender, education, and you know, um, Gerald's book was called Being Boys, and it was about rape culture. So you know, I wonder about boys, education, you know, rape culture. What, what are you your thoughts on? 
on, on rape culture, education, um, and, you know, what can we maybe do? Where can we shift things? Thanks, uh, Bjorn. So I think uh, Jared has very well put this uh, idea of rape culture, and I, I so agree with it. And I think if whatever I would say would be a reiteration, but I would just like to say that, you know, if we want to weaken this, uh, this rape culture and ultimately dismantle the rape culture, we need to dismantle the whole idea of gender. And I think that's what pretty much what Jared also talked about, that uh, that you, you know, we need to just look at these gendered practices that we are reinforcing every day in our every day's life. And that's what I really see every day in schools. I mean, I am a gender facilitator and I'm going to actually work on these gendered ideas. And I see that they are so prevalent that it's very difficult to even talk to them about all these ideas. And, and that's definitely a long way to go. So, you know, I think we could just begin by educating men and boys that, that women are human. They are not materials. We need to have a strict policy at the school as well that, uh, as well as the community level and the workplace that sexist, homophobic and femphobic slurs won't be accepted. So it, there, there is this culture nowadays that, that, you know, there are these YouTubers and, uh, you know, Instagram reel makers and everybody who used homophobic and sexist slurs and they are appreciated and they are reinforced so much. It is very important that these things now have to be a part of the life skills education at school they should be talked about and they should be talked about in terms of what is the problem behind that. Yeah. And when we, I mean, I also look at it historically and I see that, you know, in 2000 and the year 2000, the national curriculum framework in India raised a debate around the uh, content of textbooks that, that the textbooks do not really uh, have the representation of women. So it was really about that in 2000 and, uh, and contrary to the government's commitment to providing inclusive education, it rather reproduced the gender stereotypes when they started talking about the representation. So what they did was they started representing, uh, representing women, but in the stereotypical roles. And that was also showing the power that the males had and, and they still have and practice, right? So though it did talk about equality, fundamental rights, quality education for all, yet in reality led to move towards ensuring that women learn to play out their traditional social roles as like good mothers, wives, daughters within the family and the nation. So that, that gave rise to further debates about seizing the possibilities of education emerging as an enabling tool for women's empowerment. Uh, so the education system then made substantial changes and started talking about gender sensitive classrooms in 2005. So we had another curriculum framework in 2005. Uh, that talked about uh, the uh, the disability sensitive, the women sensitive, and those kind of curricula. But at the same time, that really did not talk about sexuality education at all, which we all know that that is very important, right? So, so I personally feel that we need to now imply a political advocacy lens to the gender inclusion in the education after 2005. 34 years later, now we have an education policy in place. It's called New uh, Education Policy of 2020. And that also merely mentions about the inclusion of girls and transgender students through Gender Inclusion Fund to build the nation's capacity in providing uh, quality and equitable education. But there is no mention of gender and sexual minorities. It lacks including sex and sexuality education as usual. And there is no, uh, th I think there's a now a need to have a broader understanding of gender diversity and inclusion. It is important that that we we I mean see we uh, we um, we're talking about these urban and rural population. I'm saying that you know when we are talking about the change that has already only reached the uh, the urban population, and even there we are not even talking about what sexuality is. That's that's how behind we is. So. Talking from an Indian context, I would say that, you know, there is so much that has already been researched. There is so much that's already there to work on. And that's what needs to be implied. Uh, but even further, because in global context, when I look at other countries, which, which uh, implemented these kind of curricula long ago. So we need to really learn from th that context as well. And, and I think that in that sense, these... Uh, these programs that we have developed for uh, gender equality and also they also need to be analyzed qualitatively you know the, the of course there's a need to have trainers and these trainers also need to sort of analyze uh, these programs themselves 
qualitatively in order to you know have them contextualize in the context that we are so these are certain things i'm of course i can go on and on and you know we can we can really look at so many things that can be done but uh, i think right now the stage that we are at in india this is where it is very important it's, it's an emergency now i see so that's that's where we need to really start work on, working on thanks thank you mohit yeah and i think you know that's something that has come come up again and again um the last couple of days as well there's so many things that we need to address because it is a massive problem and somebody said i think it might have been michael conroy yesterday but that there is no silver bullet um, you know, there's no one solution to this. It needs to come from all different ways. And I think part of the problem that I see all the time is like there's the establishment is established, there's power, there's money, and, you know, trying to turn all of that around when, you know, the vast majority of us have been socialized in, in a way for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, when do you start breaking that down? How do you break it down? With what age group, at what point, and what needs to go into that? And um, there's there's just massive changes needed um, on a lot of different fronts. Um, but I guess coming back um, to the question of sort of like, you know, what, what rape culture is and, um, you know, I'm interested in your views about how we can change masculinity to maybe weaken rape culture and prevent or reduce male violence against women. And I guess it sort of brings me a little bit to um, your work, Stephen, where you know you are writing about masculinity, um, male violence against women, but you also wrote a book about you know um, men and activism. So I was just wondering whether you can give a little bit of context from the work and the writing that you've done and and your views on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, the idea for that that book, that piece of research, was that um, yeah, there there is actually a long history of of men, you know, campaigning, working in collaboration with with women, you know, in in support of women's rights and against men's violence. You know, like there there were men supporting the suffragettes in here in the UK, for example. Um, yeah, I, and I think it's important to highlight that, that there is a kind of tradition there of of some men. You know, working as kind of allies to women um, and in support of feminism, and um, yeah, like I think that uh, because there's something to build on there, right? I mean, of course, it's always been a very small minority of men. <laughs> um, you know, we need many, many more men to be uh, getting on board and getting involved with this work. But um, but so yeah, first of all, to shine a spotlight on that and to look at like, well, if some men are involved in this kind of work, if some men are you know actively resisting patriarchy. Kind of gender traitors as it were um you know how yeah what can we learn from their experience from their lives um from and from the kind of structural factors as well which they've experienced which um which do help which might kind of help to, to re recruit more men basically um so yeah we spoke to a range of different men across spain sweden and the uk like look, looking at a few different countries in europe um and there were you know some common factors um so uh, you know one common factor was that uh, you know when these men were growing up they often in some way didn't feel like they fitted in with the dominant norms around masculinity and i suppose there then there's a question there but well, what is it that means that some men in particular do feel you know trapped in even more so than others by those ideas or, or kind of don't conform with them in some way but perhaps that's related to their upbringing as well in the sense that often they talked about having like women in their lives who had had a really big impact on them. Like, you know, perhaps they were typically close with their mother or, you know, they, they had a, a partner or a friend or a sister who was like a really outspoken feminist and that, that led them to reflecting on this. So that's interesting, I think as well, isn't it? That actually, you know, women have a huge impact on men and the way we think about these issues. You know, if, even if I think about myself, like it is women in my life really who have, you know, made me convinced that I need to be doing, you know, I need to be working on this really. Um, so I think that's important. Um, and then also the, the role of education, actually, that for a lot of the men, it was uh, it was becoming educated about feminism, about men's violence towards women. Typically, you know, often it was in like higher education, because I suppose you don't you don't these things, as with Mohit said, these things just aren't discussed often at school. But, you know, perhaps when they got to university, if they were able to go to university, then they might have started to have those opportunities a bit more. Um, or perhaps in their work as well, you know, people, men who might be dealing with these issues in their workplace, for example, as a police officer or as a social worker, you know, and, you, and you're actually exposed to the everyday reality and the horrificness of, of men's violence, really, that, that led some men to, to get involved. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a range of different factors. There. And there's also a question about, about the structures. And, and I suppose that in some ways, for those of us who are, 
you know, privileged in multiple different ways, such as myself, you know, perhaps in some ways it's easier for us to speak out, right? And to chat, obviously I think it's difficult for any man to challenge these expectations because they're so forceful, but maybe in some ways it's easier for me because uh, yeah, I'm not facing this, you know, I'm not going to be policed in multiple different ways because I am a white guy. I'm, I'm from a kind of middle-class background. I'm working in academia. So I'm just going to have more opportunities as well to, to, to encounter these things. So I think that is something important that those of us who do have, you know, multiple forms of privilege have a particular responsibility perhaps. But then on the flip side of that, you know, some of the men we spoke to actually talked about how being involved in other movements for social justice or be, being impacted themselves by different forms of oppression, you know, whether that's homophobia or racism, for example, that did mean that that gave them kind of more understanding, perhaps or a sense of solidarity with, with women's experiences within patriarchy. Um, yeah, so those are a few of the things which came up uh, from the research, yeah. That's really interesting, Stephen. And I think, you know, I guess you're sort of talking about some of the things that I think about when I think about getting men more involved, because I think, you know, other men can probably learn from the things that I've learned. And in my, you know, in in my personal case, the reason why I, you know, got into feminism and got reading around it is because of my partner, because beforehand I was sort of, you know, very, um, very liberal. I used to watch quite a lot of pornography. It, you know, I was the first generation of boys that probably grew up on it. Being 16, we had the internet came, you know, nobody even knew what to do about it or do with it. Um, you know, so it's a lot of my parents didn't know how to deal with it. So I just had this unsupervised access to a whole wild world of, you know, pornography and everything bad that came with the good stuff that was the internet. But I think there's also something about in, in, in what you said about men being engaged in social justice movements. And I'm thinking also particularly about the work that, you know, you do or, you know, um, Mohit and Gerald do. And I think, when you get to the point where you're writing about this, where it's becoming part of your identity, I think it is easier to then be active because I think sometimes it can very much feel like a sort of like very passive engagement of, oh yes, I think violence against women is bad. I think rape is bad, it shouldn't happen. But I think, the, the, the link that I feel sometimes is missing in there is it's not part of my identity. Um, so it's not the way that I see myself as a human being that, um, and, and I guess that's sort of part of what in, in my ideal world is sort of what I would like to see our conference do. That's why I went out and protested, because if I go on a protest against it, it will become part of my identity. Just like if I go to a Black Lives Matter protest, the fact that I'm a protester against this will become part of my identity. It sort of gets reinforced and rather than consuming passively tweets and retweeting them or reading something and sort of nodding my head, I'm actually turning the passive into the active and I'm sort of integrating it much more deeply in my being. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of like what really stood out for me when you said that. Um, and I guess, you know, I was sort of wondering what other people think about that, because I do see some nodding, but like, yeah, Gerald, I was just wondering, um, yeah, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I do, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I have struggled with the, problem of um, wondering how more men can get engaged with this, right? So Stephen was talking about that um, a little bit. And, you know, I've certainly seen this in other contexts as well. So I struggled over how, you know, how, how can we leverage more white people to be involved in anti-racist movements and, and that sort of thing. So it seems like the majority or the ones who have um, you know, the power in society, or not the power, but a lot of the power in society are the ones who really aren't all that involved, generally speaking. There are exceptions to this, and we've all sort of acknowledged that, but how do we get the majority to do that? And that's a question that I have just grappled over a lot, and I, I've come to some ideas about that. They're not conclusions, they're just sort of ruminations, I guess. And one of those ruminations is that coming at it from the vantage point of altruism is not going to work, 
right? So I don't think it works that we can try to appeal to men um, by describing things that are probably ab abstract to them. They haven't really experienced, they haven't experienced being a target of um, sexism or misogyny. So that's an abstract idea by and large. Um, they're maybe gender normative. So, you know, they know what homophobia is and they know what it looks like, but they're not really that threatened by it really. Um, in some ways, maybe they are, but in a lot of ways they're not, they can just sort of buffer it off. And I guess my real point is there has to be a different way of trying to appeal to men and getting more on board, getting more men on board than just saying, this is a problem, right? And so the other rumination I have in response to that is maybe the way to get more men on board is by saying to them in one way or another, there's things in it for you too, actually, right? This isn't just about, you know, making life easier for gender non-normative men and girls and women. That's great, that's important, but there's actually useful things for you as well. So the question could be posed to them, well, what's in it for you? Here's what's in it for you. And what's in it for you could be things like, so uh, Stephen mentioned trapped in masculinity. I think that was the phrase he used. Well, you know, a lot of guys, you know, in intimate moments with a counselor or with somebody they trust may talk about how masculinity is, is they may use the metaphor of a cage or some kind of restrictive thing. And maybe what's in it for us is, yeah, we can actually free ourselves from that to some degree, right? We can find measures of liberation through challenging these ideas of sexism, male dominance, and abuse of power. That's what's in it for us. And I kind of think that maybe if we take that tack, or if that tack comes out a little bit more, we might have more men going, actually, yes, I, I don't like this cage I'm in. I feel very restricted by it. I can't express myself. You know, they might even say, you know, I feel kind of, you know, less than human because uh, I can't express my full emotion, you know, all that. Um, so maybe more men will say, will recognize in their own heads, actually, yeah, this makes sense to me because I can feel that on a personal level. It's not an abstract idea to me. I'm just saying, those are my ruminations. I don't know. I'm just sort of trying to figure it out, right? As we all are. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you for trying to sort of put that into words because I think I, I, I agree with that because I, th I think that's one of the great gifts of the feminist movement is sort of like, it gives us this lens through which we can see things differently and challenge ourselves. And even though sometimes it's really difficult, you know, it gives us that opportunity to just like really, oh, hold on, whoa. And, and I think one of the things that I've just been thinking about is, you know, when I was speaking about sort of, um, there, there's a part of me that thinks I sort of need to make a part of my personality almost, I need to integrate it. This is not just something, oh yeah, I think that's bad. Like I sort of think, it's like, oh yeah, ice cream's quite nice when it's hot, you know, but I need to make a part of my identity of my person. But also I think one of the things that's really pushed me this year is, and it, it took quite a while, is this realization that if I'm not active, I'm passive. If I'm passive, I'm condoning things. If I'm condoning things that I am part of the problem and I'm complicit. And I think, you know, that, that in, in the UK here, there has been a campaign called Don't Be That Guy, which is sort of a video about men talking about, um, you know, have you ever, you know, um, looked a girl over? Have you ever whistled at a girl? Have you ever done this? And then it's sort of starts talking about the links between that and sexual violence. And I think it's a similar thing. We need to really start thinking about the, the broader thing um, the wider issues and, and being really honest about that as well. Because um, I think, you know, if, if you show men that, they will probably by the end of the film, you know, because I think at the end they say sexual violence starts long before you think it does. And the men will be like, oh, I've done that. Oh, I've done that. I've done that. And they go like, but I don't want to be that guy. Or like, I can't see myself being that guy. But then the link is made, but I've done that maybe I could be that guy. So maybe that is part of sort of the, um, the good things that could be in, in it for men that you were also alluding to. Um, I know we're sort of almost coming to the end. I do want to talk a little bit more about a lot of broader issues because I know you're doing some really interesting work about climate change as well, um, Stephen, which I'm really interested in hearing about because I think it feeds in again, you know, in, 
into masculinity, patriarchy, capitalism, and all of that kind of stuff. But before I turn it over to you, um, I just wanted to yeah, just get a few thoughts from you, Mohit. Um, so I think um, I I agree with what Gerald has shared about that how we can you know engage men and boys in this kind of work and and to actually uh, then achieve uh, uh, a a gender a gender free society I would say I think that's that's the aim that I look at that you know if we will uh, make the society free of gender then perhaps we'll be able to achieve the equality for that matter and I think there are there are two ways of uh, probably developing interest in something one way is through experience and the other is through exposure it is very important that we expose children from very young age to to the idea of gender and and the problems that it leads to and then only we'll be able to see people developing interest but then what we see in our education system that these kind of conversations are completely absent we do not have these kind of conversations at all so that's perhaps what what we I, I see as a way of you know I mean of course there are different ways of imparting that but the first question here in Indian context what I see is that we are not even imparting it now that there are NGOs there are uh, uh, you know these different organizations that have come up with their curriculum to sort of voluntarily uh, impart that sort of education in the system but I see why why there, there is a need to have a non-government organization for that. Why can't we have that as a compulsory component when it is an emergency? I mean, whenever a rape happens, so, you know, the entire media takes it over. There are so many questions. They're saying that, okay, we should have strict punishment for uh, men who indulge in acts like rape and all. But then nobody talks about that. What is the root cause of that? And none of the media even asks people that what is causing it and what is it that we need to work on and i think that is where now we need to go and that is where i mean of course everybody knows that this is an emergency but then how that emergency needs to be tackled is the question so yeah that's pretty much what i think about it thanks Thank you, Mohit. And I just want to like pick up on two things there. I think the first one, if I understood it correctly, when you said, you know, they're not being any gender anymore, is I think the way that you sort of said it. And I think I really took that as everybody can express themselves the way that they feel most comfortable with. Um, and I see you nodding, so I got that right. So I'm pleased with that. But I think the thing that I really noticed when, when you sort of spoke about um, government and NGOs is, and I think we see that here in the UK as well, it would be would surprise me if it's very much different in Canada, but you know, male violence against women is, is a pandemic. I mean, it's, you know, 50,000 women in the UK are raped each year, and that's the 20% of women who actually go and report it. Um, but government isn't doing anything about it and women set up rape crisis center that they need to find funding for in order to you know battle this onslaught of male violence and it, it is a massive problem because you know if the government would put money time and effort into it you know if the story would be different and you know the first rape crisis centers were set up decades ago in the UK and still nothing has changed. So yeah, I just it just really struck me how that there seemed to be a parallel there. So thank you very much for your contribution on that point. Um, for, for the last 10 minutes or so before we go to the Q&A, um, in case people have got questions, so you can start typing them up um, in the chat. Um, I'll try and do my best to do both. I'm not very good at <laughs> reading and listening at the same time sometimes but um yeah Stephen I'm just curious about the work that you're doing around sort of like masculinity and climate change because it like when I when I heard about it, when you told us about it I just thought oh, that makes absolute sense um you know of course they're connected but yeah just can you tell us a little bit more about that and you know I guess also like before we go to the q and I was just wondering if you had sort of one thing to say if like what can we as men maybe do to like do to try and contribute to a change, what could that be? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. well, I think basically, um, you know, it connects to everything we've been discussing so far, um, but kind of on a structural level, because, uh, and obviously this isn't just about patriarchy and just about masculinity, because it's also very much about capitalism, for example, and how capitalism works and colonialism and how that works. But also those things are very influenced by kind of quite masculine logics a lot of the time, I think, you know, that 
you know, like what are some of the things that have caused the climate crisis? It's like it's a sense of entitlement to exploit the natural environment, right? It's a it's a sense that we have the right and and the desire to dominate nature and and that we're separate from nature and that we you know we should have power over nature as humans um you know i think those things are these ideas which have, have led to you know human societies and systems social systems like exploiting nature to the point that we are completely destroying it you know are very much connected to some of these ideas about masculinity um but also and then you know if we look at well who is it that's you know obviously we're all contributing to the climate crisis we all have a kind of carbon footprint as it were but some of us contribute a lot more than others and um you know for a start men tend to have bigger carbon footprints than women because of some of these kind of masculine norms around things like we associate driving we associate flying we associate meat eating these are all things we associate to some extent perhaps in particular with masculinity um and also, you know, who is it that's in charge of governments that are failing to take action about climate change? It's predominantly men. I mean, there was a picture from COP26, uh, you know, of all the world leaders at COP26, and it was overwhelmingly men. Um, and who is it that's in charge of the corporations, you know, that are causing, you know, much of this environmental destruction? Uh, especially those corporations, you know, uh, which are most damaging, like the fossil fuel industry, you know, mining companies, weapons companies, again, you know, those are very male dominated industries, and especially at, at the leadership level. Um, so I just think, yeah, uh, I think gender is, uh, you know, relates to the climate crisis in all sorts of ways, because women are also tending to be disproportionately impacted by natural disasters, for example, because of gender inequality. But I think actually, you know, of course, men are there. We, it's interesting and important to look at as well. Well, how are men and masculinity affected by the, the consequences of climate change? But I do think that there are important issues there about the causes of climate change having a lot to do with men and masculinities. And so in relation to your question about what can we therefore do, I think um, that is something for all of us to re reflect on, perhaps, about how, how is our relationship with the environment, with the natural world? Um, how is that shaped by these ideas about gender, actually? And how can we create more caring relationships with with the natural world with non-human animals but then also with other humans and um, with the people in our lives um, so that will kind of hopefully um, improve men's own health and well-being it will reduce violence and abuse but it will also improve our relationship with with nature and obviously that's and create a kind of more sustainable societies which is obviously incredibly urgent given the state of the climate crisis so yeah yeah lots to do um i I guess two things sort of sprang to my mind when I heard you talking about but about the climate and um, masculinity and the impact that it has. It also brought my mind back of the impact of um, colonialism, which is also linked to masculinity and invading countries, taking all their resources, leaving them poor. And then, you know, it ties also in with where you said, well, women are most, you know, amongst the worst affected by climate change just like poor countries and that's also the result of masculinity because it's related to colonialism slavery you know all of those kind of things that men have done over decades um over hundreds of years you know um so yeah it's it's really interesting to sort of start making those connections about how it all all interlinks and i guess when I heard you speak, the thing, you know, you're talking about, I guess, empathy, non-human animals, you're sort of trying to appeal for empathy for people in um, countries that are worse off. And it makes me think about tapping into our humanity. And I think the problem with engaging men might be sometimes that we find it difficult to tap into their humanity because masculinity blocks that. We are so conditioned to not have any emotions or hide them unless they're aggressive, um, you know, that it's difficult to get in touch with that bit. And maybe that is what is stopping men engaging because they can't get to that bit where they can connect. So um, on that note, I was just wondering, Mohit and Gerald, um, you can choose who goes first um, because we're going to open it up for some questions in a moment anyway. But yeah, that, that idea of, you know, what, what can we do? Like, how can we tap into men's emotions in a positive way so they are, you know, agents of change and actually think, I don't want to be part of this. So yeah, if you've got... Mohit, please. We appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Bjorn and Jared. So um, I think, uh, like, I think we have actually reached the point where we have started from. It's it's really about what masculinity is all about. 
and and you know that is something that we really need to now work on uh like we know that like you also talked about colonial colonial rule so most part of the world has fought the battle to free their nation from the colonial rule and the real freedom for all that that are is 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 a heartbeat of an order you know that is envisioned by those sought for independence from colonial rule but the central feature is is in the in this culture it's 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 still the toxic masculinity that is the domination which is which is uh, deeply incompatible with the freedom sense the egalitarian ethic right so that is what we need to now tap on again that are we really free if we are doing what we are doing you know by by really not i mean uh, there is this concept of will and then free will and and that is also something that we, we need to now tap on that that is that is that something that we are really practicing we are consider rational beings we have the ability to rationalize our thoughts rationalize our actions but are we really doing that or are we just flowing with the emotions of uh, of the condition conditioning that's 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 been conditioned right so that's something and and globally i think you know this this archaic conservative masculine moral order uh, that's sustained largely by aggressive and violent uh, men you know it it persists and continues to find support ag- against uh, support amongst the uh, the aspiring sections of the society so that i mean we really need to uh, you know tap into these issues you know we need to really locate each of these issues and the problems of masculinity and then tap into it and then also make like gerald also talked about uh, the incentives that men can get i think now we need to really talk about the incentives that humans will get when they will be sensitive about the uh, the the things that they're causing to their uh, habitat where we are living to the environment where we are living so so that is something i, I think it's really important i mean the idea of linking uh, masculinity is patriarchy and all these issues with the climate change and those global issues i think that itself is an important start and that is where where, where we need to now you know start tapping on and and start making people look at it that this is what it is causing us and this is what now we we need to work on yeah thanks thank you mohit yeah it just makes me think about you know the the, the problem whether it's male violence against women the sexual violence you know men's violence against men climate change it's all violence that men are doing in different ways to you know nature animals other humans that don't fit with into the you know small confined space that is masculinity and you know having to have it all and doesn't really matter how i get it kind of mentality that comes with that um if i could just ask you for a last sort of um contribution gerald um on that subject then um we'll take some questions after that thank you uh sure thank you uh, so there's a couple of things one is i just want to return very briefly to the notion of capitalism and i want to add, add in another ism word and that is nationalism right so it came up that you know western countries exploit um developing countries for a lot of various reasons and all of that violence is done in the name of nationalism so there's that um the the aspect of you know what can we do um i'm going to sound kind of pie in the sky a little bit maybe uh, idealistic i don't know um and but i but i can't help but always go back to this so i want to go to what mohit was saying about a gender free society i i cannot see how there is a way out <laughs> or a way of you know really dealing with these things at a fundamental level without um doing some hardcore and much more education about what gender is in the first place i don't think most people understand what gender is most people understand gender to be what's between your legs that's that's it you're born and oh is it a boy or is it a girl there's a cartoon that i really appreciate and i put in some of my syllabi uh there's a person with a baby carriage and there's another person looking into the baby carriage and that person says is it a boy or a girl and the parent says it hasn't decided yet right so it's that idea of why do we um not why do we we do ascribe a whole host of norms and behaviors and expectations to babies the second they are born because of genitalia suddenly the script is made for that person and i would want to argue that in order to get 
uh, away from these ideas of dominant masculinity and all the violence that comes out of it, violence against girls, women, gender nonconforming men, LGBTQ people, et cetera, is about having a better understanding of what gender is. And if we assume that gender is between your legs, we've got it all wrong right from the very beginning, all of it wrong right from the very beginning. We learn gender. We learn gender right from day one. Um, so I would want to disrupt that and um, challenge that continually. And that's where education, as Mohit was pointing out, is such a valuable way to do that. And I don't even mean just formal education, I mean education in the broader sense. Education within families, education within temples and mosques and you name it. I know that's a big ask, but there it is. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating, uh, and this is sort of the last point I'll get at, because you know, I think it's kind of a useful way to think about it is, when we're talking about social movements and you know, uh, Bjorn, you mentioned, you used the phrase onslaught of male violence. And I thought that that was pretty interesting because that said to me that you know, there's, there's, there's increases of certain things and then there's decreases and there's these movements all around. And that, those have to do with power. And I was thinking about this the other day and I sort of think of all of what we're talking about as sort of, the metaphor is limited, but I'll use it anyway, sort of like a, a kaleidoscope where there's movement in one direction or another, there's movement towards um, you know, uh, rights for girls and women, and there's movements for you know, legal recognition of um, same-sex couples, et cetera, all of these things. But you don't have just that movement, you have other movements as well. And so anytime you move in one direction or another, the rest of it's going to shift and change. And I like that idea because recognizing that we don't just make progress, there's this field of dynamics constantly at play, um, field of, uh, you know, um, making uh, rights and representations and supporting those things, and then resistance to all of that, right? So all of these things are at constant play. And I think recognizing how that is in dynamics, there's nothing static about anything, might enable us to um, think about how we can deal with the dynamics of resistance, right? So that's another part of this, right? If we can, you know, have a better handle on, okay, so, you know, if we support women's rights and if we go on marches and if we, you know, lobby our MPs and all the rest of it, um, you know, what might be the resistance to that and how, how can we deal with the resistance and how can we um, not even just deal with it and confront it, but how can we, educate about that resistance and do something about it. So that's kind of where I am with, I know it's pie in the sky and it's a big ask and it's idealistic and all the rest, but that's what I go to when I think, okay, what can we do about it? Well, we can have a better fundamental understanding about what gender is because most of us have it all wrong. Thank you, Gerald. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. I know I'm not really on the panel, but for some reason I just wind up talking quite a lot today. Um, but I guess I've got my own personal experience, so that's something. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, because I agree that there's, well, the need is for large scale changes. And I think I read an article yesterday about someone about the education system in the UK and how autistic children learn. And she said, well, what we need to really do is just break it down and rebuild it. Um, and I think that applies in a lot of ways also to problems surrounding masculinity, misogyny, sexism, rape culture, all that. We, we do need to break it down and rebuild it. The only problem being um, whilst we attempt that with probably much more limited means than the patriarchy that's established over the last few thousand years, um, you know, women and children are dying. Um, so, you know, in some ways that does leave me with a little bit of a glum view um, because I think there's a huge task ahead of it. But um, I think we do need to still carry on trying to make those changes. And one of the things that has come back over and over again, not just in this weekend, but also other discussions is this thing that I have heard and I do agree with is that men listen to men. Again, patriarchy masculinity, we've got the knowledge, a woman will say something dismissed, a man will say the same thing, oh interesting, I'm listening, um, you know, and it's, it's really appalling, but the problem with that I think is 
partly as well because I wouldn't be here if I hadn't listened to women. That's the paradoxical thing about it. Without feminists, I would not be here. It hasn't men who brought. It wasn't men who brought me here. It was a different narrative and different perspective that brought me here. That was created, discussed, brought to the foreground by women who are really the change makers. And men are just, I mean, they're not even lagging behind, they're just missing, um, you know, to generalize, really. Um, I think it was um, on your podcast, Stephen, where Fiona Vera Gray was saying, we have, or like maybe it was you, we haven't even turned up to the party. Um, so, um, yeah, with that slightly glum ending, um, I do want to just open up um, the, the Q&A. And I know there's been a couple of um, questions that already came in. And I think um, one of them sort of tied into what you said um, earlier about the countercurrents, Gerald, because there's a question here about, you know, the rise of, um, you know, not just MRAs, but also more recently the um, incels as a backlash to women's rights um, and, and the Me Too movement. So, yeah, just, I wondered, I mean, you've already said something about it, Gerald, so I don't know if you want to add to that, but um, yeah, that idea of the countercurrents and that, you know, I guess I'm thinking about it as a sort of like threat to the masculinity and the response to that from certain groups of men. So yeah, maybe maybe you can start, Stephen, if you're happy to. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. No, I think that was a really important point um, because obviously I said right at the beginning that like, oh, you know, there have been these positive shifts in terms of masculinities, but also, yeah, like it's, I think the point is so important that we can't assume that things in society will just keep moving forwards because there are also many backwards shifts, right? And like, um, and I, I agree with you that I think a lot of this kind of um, backlash is, a, is men feeling threatened about the status quo being brought into question by, by feminist movements um, and, and wider social shifts. Um, and so I suppose, yeah, that's just another reason why we need to be engaging as much as possible and as early as possible with young people and especially men and boys about challenging the, the ideas that they're learning from society about gender, as, as was already discussed. And I, I mean, it is quite, um, yeah, I mean, it's quite scary, right? When you think about the, the extent of the backlash and in its different forms and how the Internet has ha perhaps helped to um, provide a platform for that, in a sense. And, for diff and I suppose for a lot of young men to be quite... Um, uh, you know, kind of exploited and seduced by these different groups. Um, and, and also, and obviously that does connect to the other issues we were talking about as well, like racism, um, xenophobia, um, and how, like very, I, I suppose, you know, it's, it's easy to see things like incels as being a very kind of obscure group in the dark corners of the internet. But these, the same kinds of ideas are being perpetuated on a much broader scale within like mainstream politics, for example. You know, obviously Donald Trump is a very obvious example. But I mean, also like, you know, um, I think I think that like incels, for example, are actually perhaps quite an extreme expression of the wider sense of entitlement to to women's affection and attention that a lot of men and boys learn from an early age from all sorts of different parts of our society. And again, for example, you know what influence does pornography, which is so widely accessible, and you know the kind of harmful ideas that's giving about uh, sex and gender, um, what influence is that having on so many men and boys? So um, so no, I think the, the thinking about the backlash is a really important part of this, um, and again, just provides further need for for the kinds of conversations which have been highlighted. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And um, we did get a question for you directly, Mohit. So I think I'm going to just um, take that because I think it's important. And I want wanted to also just sort of quickly respond to a comment on the chat um, about us all being men. Um, and that's something that I recognise. And I think it's a it's a really tricky one. Um, you know, I have a lot of feminists in my life. I talk to a lot of feminists, and um, for me personally, I got to the point where I thought me going to feminist events and talking to feminists just isn't enough. I need to organize men. Um, and whilst that might seem slightly paradoxical, because it does tie into the like, you know, men talk to men, um, and you know, why aren't there any women? It's complicated. It's, it's not a case of um, not talking to women, not listening to them, not learning from them, but sometimes it's also important to have spaces where men are organizing, men are talking, because on this subject, often men don't. Um, you know, if you look at the people who turn out to our events, 
I mean, we had six people protesting in two cities yesterday. Um, not great, not a lot, but that's the state of where men are at. We had a talk by Robert Jensen, who's you know one of the most well-known men to write about pornography for the last 25 years or so. 70% um, of the people turning up were women. So whilst I get the, the point that we're sort of partly, if, if you want to take that view, perpetuating the problem, um, it's also, I think, partly of trying to use that bad bit for a little bit of good sometimes. And if I know men listen to men, then I need to talk to men about it because they will actually listen to me and maybe then I can get, you know, and also, otherwise I'm just relying on the emotional labor of women to try and educate men to give a shit. Then they have to put in all the energy um, to, talk to the men who harass them, who rape them, who murder them in vast numbers all across the globe. So it's, it's a really complicated one. Um, so, but thank you very much for bringing that up because I think it's also really important to address those things. Um, and, you know, um, we, we do talk to women about what we're putting on. You know, I, I sort of go like, mm, what do you think, is this okay? Um, so, you know, the feedback is really important. If anyone has any feedback like that, please, you know, just send us an email. Because again, I'm going to quote Fiona Vera Gray again, who said on your podcast, what I want from men is do something. If you fuck up, we'll tell you, listen to it and then do it differently. And I think that's sort of the objective of what um, Chris and I are trying to do here. Um, but I really want to just um, ask this question to you, Mohit, because I think it is an um, interesting and important one. Um, and that was just really about the um, role of um, castes in India and whether that has any impact on how masculinity is framed. So um, yeah, if you could say something about that, that'd be really great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. And I think uh, this actually takes us back to the argument of intersectionality, uh, what Jared also talked about, that how it is not just about uh, femininity or homophobia. It, it's, it has multiple dimensions. And that is like, you know, the race, uh, the uh, class and everything. So in India, that's that's about caste. So that's an ongoing oppression. And uh, uh, when when we talk about masculinity, when we talk about oppression, when we talk about power, so it's it's that 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 men who hold certain power. So you know, the, let's say an upper caste uh, man who holds certain position, certain power, will practice masculinity or those sort of violent behaviors on women, uh, and also the men who are uh, not at the same power position, that is the men from a lower caste or so to say lower class for that matter. But at the same time, the men from those uh, castes who are considered to be lower caste, they also practice masculinity, but not on these men, but on the, on the women of their community. So it's 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 a power structure. It's a power hierarchy that's that's been created in the society. So it's the problem is then we would say not the masculinity but uh, the the idea of violence that the idea of power that yes because I am above somebody in the power hierarchy I have the liberty I have the freedom to actually oppress them. So that's the problem. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Mohit. Um, we might actually have time for one more. Um, so let me just have a quick look. Um, there was one earlier. There was one about which I thought was quite interesting about um, the term toxic masculinity and how um, I guess, you know, people sort of feel about that. So if, if, if you know, each of you could just sort of give a, give a soundbite on that, I'd be interested in that as well, actually, because it is a word that is often used. Um, which is actually quite complex, but I think like in a lot of the conversations um, that happen, when, once a word gets sort of quite widely used, people sort of lose a little bit of track of what it actually means and spend time on thinking about, oh, I'll just use that word toxic masculinity. I do actually know what that means. And, you know, so yeah, maybe um, if you can start, Gerald, um, that'd be really great. Sure. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, it's it, like you were alluding to. It's it's one of those phrases that uh, is used a lot, and I think that it's used so much that it's just it's lost some of its meaning. 
Um, and I know that, you know, some people just kind of roll their eyes at the term. Um, so that's another way that it's lost meaning. Um, but also I think that there's critiques of it. And one of those critiques that I hear kind of regularly, I suppose, is that, you know, there's nothing toxic about masculinity, actually. And I actually agree with that. Like there's, you know, I know that toxic masculinity is trying to get at a particular expression of masculinity. But the way that it gets taken up by some folks is that it's a it's a description of masculinity in general. And so, you know, I, I, I say to, you know, those critics, uh, yeah, you're right. It's, it's masculinity itself is not toxic. Um, there's nothing wrong with masculinity in itself. It's the way that it gets expressed and the reasons why power and violence and all the things that we've been talking about that are the problem. Um, I think the term has sort of lost its currency, I guess, is my, my real point. I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, any other thoughts on, on that one? Because I saw a lot of nodding, but um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has got anything to add to that. Do you want to go first, Mohit, or shall I? Or? Sure, sure, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just quickly would just say I do see it slightly differently to Gerald, but it's probably I think it's just a question of how, you know, it's a conceptual thing, isn't it? But um, because <clears throat> I've been quite influenced, I suppose, or impacted by the thinking of like John Stoltenberg, who I think wrote about, um, you know, that like talking about toxic masculinity is like talking about toxic cancer in the sense that like I think the problem sometimes when we talk about toxic masculinity, it's kind of saying, oh, well, the problem's over there with that particular group of men or that particular form of masculinity. But actually, for me, I, I do think it is much broader, you know, and obviously there are lots of different forms of masculinity. But for me, the ultimate aim is kind of like what Mahit was saying. It's about creating a society where we, you know, where we're reducing these expectations to conform to any set of ideas about gender. Um, and, and obviously, yeah, and eventually getting rid of gender altogether. But in the short term, it's reducing those pressures rather than just creating a nicer form of masculinity. Actually, for me, it's about just trying to remove any expectations, because I do think we ultimately always seem to end up defining masculinity you know, as, as more valued than femininity. So I think that binary is always like hierarchical. So so for me, it's like getting rid of the binary altogether, I suppose. But um, but anyway, yeah, Mohit, I don't know if you want to. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Stephen. So I think I, I, I sort of agree with that. I also think that till the time masculinity is masculinity and femininity is masculinity and both, sorry, femininity is femininity and both of them are looked at separately, that's problematic for me because that's what I, I don't adhere to. I think that's the toxic idea of gender itself. So in order to have the right idea of gender itself would be that, that you know, we have any ex expression and it's not seen in binaries. And, and, and that's when, when I look at uh, masculinity in certain way, I would say it's toxic. But then, yeah, at the same time, uh, I agree with what Gerard also said that, that you know, masculinity, when, so like when, when we are saying that we, we should be free to express uh, ourselves in any way possible, so then in that case, when you're talking about masculinity, which is not violent, then that's okay. And it's not toxic. It's it's only, uh, I'm calling it toxic masculinity when the masculinity has a particular form that is violent in its nature, that is oppressive in its nature. So yeah, thanks. Brilliant, thank you, Mohit. And it just, it brings me back to this idea of, um, that I often find myself sort of thinking about that a lot of things are on a continuum. So on the far end, you'll have toxic masculinity. On the other far end, you'll have really caring masculinity, um, like really humane masculinity. And I think sometimes the problem is when we use words, um, you know, because meanings are really important. and for ease of communication, we all, all often sort of dumb it down a little bit. We will say it, but the meaning of what we're trying to convey actually doesn't really turn up unless you really start unpicking it. What have I just said? You know, what when I say toxic masculinity, we've all heard it, but we'll all still have a different concept of what that means. And I think having those conversations about, okay, you just said that. I think you mean this, is that is that right? You know, that's, that's also conversations that, that are needing to happen. Um, and um, yeah, I must say, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation this evening. Um, it's been really great. And I think two things that really stood out for me is for one, it's, we have got quite a big task, but you know, if, if I look at myself, um, I know, I have changed a lot. I wouldn't be this person, like I said, if I hadn't had lots of conversations with, with feminists, with you know some other men. And change is possible. And I think the most 
the biggest blockade probably is how do we get men to let go of their masculinity, which restricts them, but also protects them to enable them to open up and be vulnerable and to listen to difficult things because it's scary because they don't really do emotions and, and, and those things. And, you know, what are the different ways in which we can tap into boys aged, you know, six months to men aged 100 and try and reach them all is going to be a massive effort and require lots of different strategies, I guess. Um, but yeah, I just want to finish off by um, really thanking you all. Um, if you can hang around for two minutes afterwards, that'd be nice and we can just sort of say goodbye. Um, and I also really want to um, thank everybody who's attended this evening. Um, it's been a real pleasure hosting this for you. And um, yeah, thank you very much for turning up and supporting us. And if you're around tomorrow, we are going to have one last event, which is a workshop on um, sexism and misogyny in music. And um, so if you can make it, great to see you there. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your support. So yeah, and um, big thanks again to all the speakers tonight.